Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. Sometimes real life is funnier than any comedian could write it. There's a whole new category of comedy. It's called online conversations with children. My husband and I are surprising our six-year-old boy by taking him to Disney for his birthday tomorrow. We've been in the car for four plus hours and he still thinks we are on our way home from school. He keeps saying, looks like we're almost home. Bless his heart. Update, we arrived at Disney World. He thinks we took a wrong turn and he's very concerned about who is going to feed our cat. <laughs> and this is a different child. This is a mom talking about her three-year-old. We've been trying to teach the three-year-old what to do in case of an emergency. Yesterday we tested her. What would you do if you found me on the floor and you couldn't wake me up? I could see her little brain working and she finally said, I would go into the kitchen and eat, every, eat everything I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Those are two very different children. Do you sense that? One's a little cautious, a little concerned about things being not ordinary and the other's like, this is my chance. <laughs> you know? We're all different. You know, I'm, I'm aware and Micah, my little 10-year-old, she turned 10 last Sunday, and so um, we celebrated yesterday with a lot of sugar. And there will be more sugar all week. Like, so one of the things that the agreements is that Daddy makes pancakes. So, but she's been wanting like this much whipped cream and this much pancakes. So she's an amazing kid, and it's just been such a joy to see her grow and change. I'm aware, too, that when I give a, a message here on a Sunday morning or any time that people are at different places and that some, a talk on gratitude is like, <laughs> boring, been there, done that. And to some, they've never really been able to get the hang of how we can be grateful when things are not what we want them to be. So what I invite you to do today and here's the thing, I can't be all things to all people, I think you know that. I learned that day one of this job. But what I try to bring is what's alive in me. I try to listen to my own, live that intuitive movement or energy when I'm sharing, and I talk on gratitude every year. Every year I talk about it. And I can't give the same talk every year, so I'm listening to what, what's moving me today. And I hope that you'll just listen with your heart. There may not be a single thing you learn today. How many of you know Reverend Dr. Michael Beckwith at the Agape Center in Los Angeles? I don't think I've ever learned a fact from Michael Beckwith, but he ignites the truth in me. So maybe even, and I'm not pretending that I've got that kind of power and energy that he has, but maybe something that you, you didn't learn anything new today, but there's a new opening in you to experience something you already knew at a deeper level. That's my invitation to you today. I always give a talk on gratitude by distinguishing between the two types of gratitude. There is transactional gratitude. You give me something, I am grateful. That's a great way to be grateful. And that's when I'm working with the kids. That's probably about the extent of their consciousness at this point, is it feels good when I get things going my way, right? Can I get an amen for that? It does. It feels good when life is going according to plan. And it feels good, and gratitude in those moments is easy. But every year, I remind you that gratitude is more than a response to condition. That gratitude is a choice in consciousness which becomes a causative force. That by simply moving ourselves through our choice, through our free will, into the attitude of gratitude, into the consciousness of good, it welcomes good into our experience, no matter what is happening at the level of condition. So that's the talk that I give every year, Thanksgiving. Let's take the offering. We already did that, so I guess we can go home now. I've got a little bit more to say this year. And what I've been aware of this week, preparing for this message, is that 
It's feeling and choice, right? That sometimes we mistake feeling grateful for the choice to be grateful. And I want to dig into that a little bit today. Because how do we choose to be grateful when we don't feel grateful? And this is like graduate level of gratitude is what we're talking about today. How do we get to that place of choosing? And I often use this passage from St. Paul, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 17. Rejoice always. Really, always? Okay. Pray continually. How do you do that? Those are the first two verses of this passage. Rejoice always, pray continually. Anybody already feeling a little bit spiritual, like like insecurity, like I can't do that? That's just me, okay. Verse 18, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you. Sometimes I read that and I'm so encouraged, and sometimes I read that and I'm like, how the heck? How the heck am I going to rejoice always in the middle of a global pandemic, in all the uncertainty that we've got going on in our world, how am I supposed to pray continually? i got a job to do and bills to pay. And how do I give thanks in all circumstances? Because there's some things going on in the world that I'm not thankful for, to be honest. There are things happening, some trend lines I see developing in human culture and in this nation that don't put me in the feeling of gratitude. So something else is being asked for here because that is beyond our humanity to rejoice always and to pray continually and to give thanks in all things. There must be something more to this teaching than just snapping your fingers and flipping a switch. Something else must be asked for here. And this is what I'm talking about today. It's our choice. That even when things are not what we want, there is a choice available to us. And that's, where, that's our spiritual power. And this puts me in mind of, of two words. And if you were on the Friday live stream I do on Facebook, you probably already got this part, so you can um, check your email for a moment if you'd like. I'm talking about will and willingness. The will is that part of us, sometimes described by me and others as the divine masculine. It's the part of us that has intention, choice, and action. I get to call the shots in my own life. That's our will. And that's important, and we get to have it, and it's ours to be used for good. And then sometimes it's just not enough, because I've been making decisions and telling the, the universe what I want to experience, and yet it's not showing up in exactly that way. And then what I find to be so helpful in these moments is to choose to let go and let God. Is to choose to allow people to act just as they are acting with their free will. And then that opens me to this space of willingness. That opens me to this space of possibility. A couple things I want to point out to you. You may not be aware of this, but the way things used to be are not the way things are now. Did you know that? Is that news? Okay. And here's another piece, just to add on to that. The way things will be is not the way things are now. And here is the, the, the crack in, the, in the, the code that we can get to. Using our will and our choice, we have a say-so about the shape of our future. Did you know that? We have this little thing here, we, a little trade secret we call the law of mind action. Thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. That there is a creative mind at work in us that is the mind of God within us. And if we can align ourselves with a higher truth, this is the proper use of the will is to choose a higher path for ourselves, for our family, for our church, for our nation. We are not at the whim of a chaotic and random universe. We have been given choice and free will for good. And so we make decisions and we take actions that are in, line, uh, in alignment with the highest truth we know and still, it doesn't always go the way we want. It still does not always turn out in exactly the way we want. 
And thank God for the Rolling Stones who told us about this. They prophesied in the 1960s that you can't always get what you want. You can't always get what you want. But if you try sometimes, you must, just might find what, what do they tell us? You get what you need. Thank you, Mick. And that's really the truth. That it's not either this or that. That we are here to use our will, our choice, our intention and our action to go for it. To create the life we want. And to say, to ask boldly for what we want. And when it doesn't turn out in exactly the shape. I remember Jill Carroll gave a talk here one time. She was talking about relationships and she said... You know, there are people in our lives that we didn't ask for, but they're ours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just saw light bulbs of recognition going off all over this room. It's not what I looked for, but here it is. And maybe there are no mistakes in this universe, in God's universe. Maybe this is not happening to me, but for me. And so, can you feel me here? That the choice, I can make choices towards the life of my dreams, but then I work with whatever shows up, recognizing that God is in this too. So for both, our will, we use choice. And in our willingness, we use choice. And together, this becomes the way Derek Rydell, who's a New York, New York, I mean, a Hollywood screenwriter, and he, but he's also a member of this movement. He says it this way, flow, row, flow, row. You get it? Merrily, merrily down the stream. It's both. It takes your effort and your intention, and then sometimes you just got to move with the flow of it. And you'd think I would stop there, but I've got more to say. Oh, some of you are grateful. I guess, thank you. Well, how about that? I chose for my title today, I'm going to make sure I get this right, Giving Thanks, The Portal to Grace and Abundance. That is a great title. That's a lot for me to live up to. But I find this to be the way that when I give thanks in all circumstances, just like Paul annoyingly said to the church in Thessalonica, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all things. If I'm willing to give thanks, even in the stuff that is not showing up the way I want, then something opens. Then suddenly I realize that even though I've been using my will and my intention, there may well be a grand design that is greater than anything I can currently hold or comprehend. Somehow God is here too. And then something in me begins to expand. And that's why I call it a portal, that it's out of my limited thinking of the way the universe ought to operate. Somebody did not get my memo, but into a greater, grand, overarching design, G-O-D, that is beyond, it's over the horizon sometimes, I can't see it all, but I can trust that something powerful and beautiful is happening and when I'm using the word abundance, we're going to be uh, doing a series in January. Um, I haven't quite got the title yet, but it's an abundance and prosperity series. And I'm really lit up by the idea that it's not just about money. This is what our co-founder Myrtle Fillmore says. True prosperity is not making money or putting out good and developing property. True prosperity is determining what our individual soul requires in order to cause it to unfold more and more of God. And then, how to harmonize its expression with the needs of our fellow man so that all are really benefited and inspired to unfold and express more of their inner spiritual resources. You see, when we're talking about abundance, we're not talking about just your bank account or your 401k. What we're talking about is the life that supports your full expression and experience in God. And if you're trying to shut money out of that, well, that doesn't work either. But if you're trying to limit true prosperity teaching into money, 
you're limiting so much of what it is. You, true abundance is feeling supported in every area of your life. It's feeling free, knowing that the decisions you're making will give you and deliver you into the kingdom of God or else they'll give you to the door that will get you down the other path to find the other way. That everything is working together for your good. I want to share a story from the Torah, the uh, Hebrew scriptures, what those of us who grew up in Christianity called the Old Testament. There was a woman who had lost her husband, and her husband was in the same school of prophecy and study that was led by the prophet Elisha. And he had experienced this man, this husband, this father who had died, had experienced some difficulty and he had made, made some unwise loans, had taken out some money from a loan shark, basically. And when he died, he had no, the wife, his widow, had no way to pay it back and so the loan shark came back to her and said, well, fine, we'll just sell your children in slavery to me and then we'll call it square. And she was faced with unbelievable heartache at this prospect of losing. She's already lost her husband. She's lost her means of support. She has no money, and now she's going to lose her children into slavery. And so she made a decision to go seek out her dead husband's boss, the prophet Elisha. And in boldness, she goes to him and says, remember my servant, your servant, my husband. He died. And now they are coming, the creditors are coming to take my children. Help me. And Elisha does something really interesting. And I've taught this story before. It's, uh, the way that Eric Butterworth teaches it in spiritual economics is powerful. I'm going to start there. He says, what do you have? What resources do you have available right now? And she says, well, all I have, I only have one small jar of oil in the house of olive oil. And Eric Butterworth talks about the sin of onlyness. Not sin, really. But just that we're only, sometimes we focus on this little, this is all I got, God. This is it. But then the prophet Elisha, who is tapped into this bigger possibility, he says, well, let's start there. Let's start with what you do have. Let's see what miraculous, expansive experience God can create with what you do got. And he said this, go to all of your neighbors and collect as many jars, borrow them as you can, and we'll see what happens. And he said, when you get all the jars collected in your home, close the door and pour from your vessel into the other jars. I love these miracle stories. I want to say too, do you remember the Star Trek episode where... Kirk was on the planet with the lizard guy, who, and that, that, that people, their language was all in metaphor. Somebody in Tanakwa at Shalagwa. You know, that was like, that's the way they understood everything was in story and metaphor, that those stories said something about what's happening now, helps us move into it. It's a great episode, really is. <laughs> that's the way I hold these old stories. To be frank, I don't care if it happened that way or not. If this miraculous expansion of the oil, that is beside the point for me. It's what does it mean? What's the metaphor? What's the myth in my um, spiritual hero's journey that is showing itself to me now if I can get a hold of it? And so she does as the prophet commanded and she had her sons go collect the vessels and they closed the door. And they began to pour the oil and it filled the first jar. They brought the second jar, and they, from this small vessel, it filled it to the brim. And on and on. Until it says, she says, bring another jar. And her son says, there are no more. And the oil stopped flowing. What Butterworth teaches us is that God's source, the source that is God, is limitless and inexhaustible. And we can have as much of it as we can receive. Whatever space and container in consciousness we can create, God will fill it. 
And when we're full with all we can hold, that's all we can hold. It's a beautiful, beautiful teaching. And so as I was trying to introduce those kids to that word consciousness and growing our consciousness, that's what it's about. Expanding our capacity for good. Expanding our capacity to recognize it and receive it. 30 years I've been doing this work. It's miraculous. The changes that have been wrought in my life by this. By this deepening into how good God wants my life to be. It is a miracle. To me, greater than oil. <laughs> my experience of the good of God has expanded and expanded. And I love that meaning of the story. But something else occurred to me about this story today. Many of us have found ourselves in a situation where we are living a life we never asked for. We are finding ourselves where the, pl the thought, the plan that we had set out before. You can imagine this woman, her, her husband was in a prestigious spiritual study group. I mean, he was going somewhere. And she had these two sons. And in the ancient world, to have sons, that's a guarantee for her old age. And so she, her life was going somewhere. And then he died. And the life that she is living is not the life she thought she would be living. How many people in this past year have I counseled with, have I spoken to, have been in that woman's shoes where things have not gone the way they wanted? They find themselves depressed and grieving, fearful. How many of us have felt our back against the wall and not knowing the way to go forward. And when I look at her story from that perspective, from the people that I love who I've spoken to in this church in this past year, it changes for me a little bit. And what I notice is something I've never noticed before. The actions she took, even though they... There was no guarantee any of it was work. And, you know, she did borrow the jars, and she did send her sons, and she did pour. Just, there was no guarantee any of that was going to do what she hoped. But let's back up in this story. She's alone and penniless. The creditor is coming to take her children. And what does she do? She asks for help. She asks for help. How many of us are silently suffering in the disappointments of our lives and we're unwilling to call someone and ask for help? If you're willing to get honest about where you are and reach out I guarantee you, the person you call may not have the answer, but they'll know someone. I share about my recovery and my addiction story here, not because it's such a great landmark achievement that I have not been able to, I have been able to live 22 years without drinking alcohol, although that's a miracle. But I share it to remind people that miracles happen. And on that day, November 18th, 1999, I asked for help. Yeah. And you've heard me talk about it. Bad coffee in crowded rooms with a lot of dirty ashtrays. That's the way it was in 1999. I found the help I needed. And I don't know what help you need today. I know that, as I said, we come in at many different levels of spiritual understanding and healing. But I know there are people listening to my voice right now that are desperate, desperate for healing, for change. And there may just be one person who needs to hear this today, and I will speak it from the bottom of my heart. Ask for help, and help will come. Do not suffer alone. This is not the Thanksgiving speech you were probably looking for. 
I want to close with this quote by W.H. Murray. Our dear friend Mary Morrissey teaches from this a lot. And it's just a powerful quote. W.H. Murray was a mountain climber. And he was invited to um, scale Everest many times. He never had the money. And then one time, Hillary invited him to come, and he, he made a decision. He didn't have the money, but he, made, he committed himself to it. He said, yes, I will be there. And he had to put down a deposit. Those deposits are wonderful spiritual practices. Do you know that? I'm going to put some skin in the game. And this is what Murray said. Oh, by the way, he did mount. Um, he did, how do you say that? Summit. He summited Everest. He says this, the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. All sorts of things occur to help one that never otherwise would have occurred. A whole stream of events issues from the decision which no one could have ever dreamed would have come their way. When you ask for help, from God, from your church, from AA. Not only will you get help in human form, but the very universe recognizes your receptivity and rushes in with all kinds of support and help. I am here to tell you, your life is a miracle waiting to happen. Would you pray with me now? In this moment, feeling this power of expansion and transformation, recognizing that this is, the, this is the way, this is the nature of God to reveal itself into form in greater and greater and higher and higher realms. So I speak my word for everyone within the sound of my voice that the impulse for evolution, that the seed of transformation and overcoming is already within you only awaiting your choice, your willingness to say yes and to commit to being the you you already are in the mind of God. So I speak freedom for those who are bound. I speak peace for those who are troubled. I speak abundance for those who are feeling scarcity. I speak love for those who are alone that God has already given what is needed. And I see right now in this community and beyond, people are opening, opening, opening to the great reality of the abundance of spirit. And we step into it with deep, deep gratitude. Miracles occur. And we just say yes and thank you, God. We let it be, and so it is. Amen. So if no one has told you today that they love you, I love you. God bless you. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.